Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel, and this video is part of a series of videos on Proclus' Elements of Theology. In this video, I'm going to talk about Propositions 56 through 60. Throughout the series, I've been using the E.R. Dodds translation. For those of you who don't have the text, there is a link in the description box for a PDF version. Okay, I'm going to start today with Proposition 56, and notice that here Dodds gave this section the title of the Grades of Causality. Grades of Causality sounds like now we're going to see levels or layers, if you will, of causes. And so we start here with Proposition 56. All that is produced by secondary beings is in a greater measure produced from those prior and more determinative principles from which the secondary were themselves derived. And here's his proof. For if the secondary has its whole existence from its prior, thence also it receives its power of further production, since productive powers reside in producers in virtue of their existence and form part of their being. Okay, what he's doing here is he's really drawing from Proposition 7, which we've seen a few times already. Here again is a quick refresher is Proposition 7. Every productive cause is superior to that which it produces. And as we've seen before, there is this one very important section, this one very important sentence that we need to understand. That because the cause gives the product its existence, it must also furnish the power proper to that existence. And so coming back to Proposition 56, we see that if the secondary has its whole existence from its prior, from its cause, then it would also receive from that cause its power of further production because the productive powers reside in the producers in virtue of their existence, and it forms part of their being. So the cause gives its effect, the power to exist, and being a cause then for causes is part of their being. But if it owes to the superior cause its power of production, then to that superior it owes its character as a cause, insofar as it is a cause, and this is a character meted out to it from thence in proportion to its constitutive capacity. If so, the things which proceed from it are caused in virtue of its prior, for the same principle which makes the one a cause makes the other an effect, and if so, then the effect owes to the superior cause its character as an effect. So what does this mean? Well, imagine we have three terms. We'll just call them A, B, and C. So A causes B, which in turn causes C. Now, when A is functioning as a cause, then in relation to that, B is the effect. But if B also got the power from A to be a cause in its own right, then it would be the cause of C. What he's saying here is that C could not be an effect unless A had given the power of being a cause to B. And so even though B is a cause of C, A is even more so a cause of C. And so the conclusion of this first paragraph is that the effect owes to the superior cause its character as an effect. Now Proclus is going to take it even a step further, and I want you to keep that same image in mind of A being a cause of B, which is a cause of C. He says, it is evident that the effect is determined by the superior principle in a greater measure. So not only is A ultimately the cause of C, but it's a cause in a greater measure than was B. For if the latter has conferred on the secondary being the causality which enabled it to produce, if A gave B the power to be a cause, then it must have itself, it must itself, excuse me, have possessed this causality primitively. 
And it is in virtue of this that the secondary being generates, having derived from its prior the capacity of secondary generation. But if the secondary is productive by participation, B is a cause by participation in A, then the primal and the primal is a cause primitively and by communication, then the latter is causative in a greater measure, inasmuch as it has communicated to another the power of generating consequence. And so he's saying here that A, as the highest cause in that chain, is a cause in a greater degree than the later causes in the chain. Okay, going on to Proposition 57, this one states that every cause both operates prior to its consequent and it gives rise to a greater number of posterior terms. So here's that same proposition again. Now when we get to the corollary to this one, we're going to see that Proclus uses the good, the intelligence, and soul as his example. So I use them here as well. And he has an image something like this that the good extends both higher and lower as in terms of being a cause than does intelligence. Intelligence functions as a cause in, to a lesser degree than the good, but to a greater degree than soul. And soul is the cause of fewest things. And the reasoning behind this again goes back to Proposition 7. For if it is a cause, it is more perfect and more powerful than its consequent. And if so, it must cause a greater number of effects. For greater power produces more effects. Equal power would produce equal effects and lesser power, fewer effects. And the power which can produce the greater effects upon a like subject can produce also the lesser. Whereas a power capable of the lesser will not necessarily be capable of the greater. If, then, the cause is more powerful than its consequent, then it is productive of a greater number of effects. Okay, but now he still has to show why it's both, why it stretches beyond its subsequence, both higher, both above and below. But again, the powers which are in the consequent are present in a greater measure in their cause. For all that is produced by secondary beings is produced in a greater measure by prior and more determinative principles. And so he's building on 56. The cause then is cooperative in the production of all that the consequent is capable of producing. And if it first produces the consequent itself, then it is of course plain that it is operative before the latter in the activity which produces it. Thus, every cause operates both prior to its consequent and in conjunction with it, and it likewise gives rise to further effects posterior to it. So to see this more clearly, he gave us a corollary, and I think this will be very helpful to us. He says that from this it is apparent that what soul causes is caused also by intelligence, but not all that intelligence causes is caused by soul. Intelligence operates prior to soul, and what soul can bestow on secondary existences, intelligence bestows in a greater measure. And at a level where soul is no longer operative, intelligence still irradiates with its own gifts things on which soul has not bestowed itself. For even the inanimate participates intelligence, or at least the creative activity of intelligence, insofar as it participates form. And so we see the intelligence can continue to function as a cause even when soul no longer can. And again, what intelligence causes is also caused by the good, but not conversely. For even privation of form is from the good, since it is the source of all things. But intelligence, being form, cannot give rise to privation. And so what he's showing us here is that the good is the cause of everything, whereas intelligence has a bit less of a scope than the good, and soul an even lesser scope than intelligence. 
Now, Proposition 58 is a natural result of Proposition 57. All that is produced by a greater number of causes is more composite than the product of fewer causes. And this would make sense if something has as its cause the good and intelligence and soul, then it's more composite that something, than something that only can look to the good as its cause. Okay, so the argument here, for if every cause gives something to that which proceeds from it, then the more numerous causes will bestow more gifts, and the less numerous fewer, so that of the participants some will be made up of more participated elements, others of fewer, in virtue of their respective procession from more or fewer causes. But things made up of more elements are more composite, and things made up of fewer of the same elements are less so. The product, then, of more causes is always more composite, and of fewer causes, less so. For what the latter participates is participated by the former, but not conversely. So notice that the effects that would fall at the top or bottom of this diagram have fewer causes than things that would fall in the middle. And so, therefore, they are simpler. The things that would be in the middle that are caused by soul as well as intelligence and good would then be more composite. And so now we're going to continue building. We saw that 57 followed from 56, 58 built on that, and 59 is going to build on what we were just looking at. Because those circles were at both the top and the bottom, then 59 is what follows. Whatever is simple in its being may be either superior to composite things or inferior to them. And I think this one is pretty easy to see since we just saw it in that diagram. Uh, for if the extremes of being be produced by fewer and simpler causes, then the intermediate existences by more, then the latter will be composite, which we just saw. While of the extreme terms, some will be simpler as being higher and others as being lower. But that the extreme terms are produced by fewer causes is plain, since the higher principles both begin to operate before the lower, and they extend beyond them to things which the lower by remission of power are precluded from reaching. For the last being is, like the first, perfectly simple, for the reason that it proceeds from the first alone. But the one is simple as being above all composition, and the other as being beneath it. And the same reasoning applies to all other terms. Okay, I want to wrap up today's video with Proposition 60. And here we're bringing in the idea of power. Whatever principle is the cause of a greater number of effects is superior to that which has a power limited to fewer objects and which gives rise to parts of those existences constituted by the other as wholes. Okay, let's see what his case is. He says, if the one is cause of fewer effects and the other of more, and the fewer form a part of the more numerous, then whatever is produced by the former cause will be produced also by the latter, but the former is not productive of all that the latter produces. Okay, this is, the way it's worded is a bit confusing. When we see former and latter, we want to think metaphysically former and metaphysically latter. But what he's actually saying here, former is in the one he mentioned first. So that makes it very confusing. So let me plug in soul and intelligence so that we can see something concrete. This is just an example, but I'm going to plug that in to make the sentence a little bit easier to understand. So he's saying that if soul is cause of fewer effects and intelligence is the cause of more and the fewer form a part of the more numerous, the things that soul causes form a part of the things that intellect causes and the things intellect causes are more numerous, then whatever is produced by soul will be produced also by intelligence. But soul is not productive of all that intelligence produces. 
And so continuing with this example, then, intelligence is therefore the more powerful and comprehensive. For as consequent is to consequent, so is cause to cause, considered relatively. And that which can give rise to more effects has greater and more universal power. But this means that it is near to the cause of all things. And what is near to the cause is in a greater measure good, because the good is that cause, and that's Proposition 12. The cause of more numerous effects is therefore superior in its being to that which produces fewer. Well, I do hope you found those explanations helpful, and if you did, please give this video a like, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those below. Thank you very much, and I hope you'll join me next time.